Welcome to MedMark's webinar series. Today's presentation is titled, Medical Device Warnings for Home Use Devices. I'm Kate Klaus, Senior Attorney in MedMark's Risk Management Department. On behalf of MedMark and today's presenters, Bill Judge and Nicole Walsh, thank you for joining us. Bill Judge is a shareholder in Hill Ward Henderson's litigation group. His practice primarily involves products liability, commercial disagreements, automotive and general liability, construction disputes, medical malpractice, cybersecurity, and intellectual property. He has represented a variety of Fortune 500 clients in litigation involving medical devices, airbags, seatbelts, automotive brake systems, consumer products and appliances, pharmaceuticals, restraint of trade and non-compete agreements, contract disputes, premises liability, complex multi-unit construction projects, and intellectual property. In addition to statewide representation of clients in Florida, Bill has also handled several litigation matters in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Nicole Walsh is a senior associate in Hill Ward Henderson's litigation group. Her practice includes the defense of product liability and tort claims, as well as premises liability and personal injury actions. She also represents automobile dealerships defending cases on sales, finance and insurance, and advertising practices, along with a diverse array of digital accessibility claims. Nicole's practice affords her extensive experience in both federal and state court, as well as arbitration matters. She has defended national clients in numerous automotive, trucking, consumer products, and power tool products cases throughout Florida, as well as represented retailers and home builders in premises liability matters. Clients represented include those in the manufacturing, automotive, retail, financial services, hospitality, sports, and home building industries. And with that, I am pleased to turn things over to Bill. Thank you, Kate and Heather. I appreciate it. Uh, again, my name is Bill Judge. I want to thank everybody for uh, hanging around, I guess, uh, on a Friday afternoon to join us. Uh, greetings from uh, sunny and hot Tampa, Florida. If you haven't been to Florida recently, come on down. We could use the uh, the revenue and and uh, it's there's get here in your car. Anyway, um, I've been working with Minmark Insured for coming up on 20 years now. So worked with a lot of different devices, including some uh, home medical devices, which we're going to talk about today. Um, Nicole, as was mentioned, is a senior associate here in my firm who specializes in products liability. And before we start, I really need to thank uh, our paralegal Tori Carlin who really put this whole thing together. Um, she's mostly the brains and the labor behind everything. So what we're gonna talk about today is a uh, history of medical devices for in-home use. Uh, we'll do a little tongue in cheek on that as well because we've got some bizarre ones from the past. We'll talk about IFUs, which are, the, as you know, the instructions for use. Uh, we're gonna do a little case law, not, not enough to put you to sleep, but just kind of tell you what's going on for those of you who are interested and then the future of the medical devices, and which I think everyone will agree is, is tremendous right now, especially what's happened with COVID and the fact that so much care has been relegated to uh, at home or virtual ways. So medical devices <clears throat> have been used in home health care uh, for people who use them for the environments their response environments is, is what they're tailored towards. <clears throat> Excuse me, the, the people who use them can either be obviously professionals, they can be home health nurses, home health aides, or they can be the uh, patients themselves. So there's a wide variety of possible users as opposed to a medical device which is strictly intended for a hospital. So with that wide variety, uh, you've got to take into things such as space available, light noise levels, uh, temperature, humidity levels, who's going to be present in the actual uh, space with the user, children's pets, et cetera. So all those things have to be taken into account. Uh, the most historical uses of medical devices are for delivering you know, things like first aid, uh, common medication, and everything from the little plastic bo uh, cup that you use to give your children the, uh, the, the liquid Tylenol or for the coughs to measuring out pills, breaking them into reduced sizes, et cetera. Other types of medical devices that uh, we're probably familiar with are assistive technologies and durable medical equipment, or what's known as DME. The assistive technologies are mostly mobility aids like walkers, chains, uh, wheelchairs, crutches. Sometimes they're sensory aids, such as glasses or hearing aids. 
and sometimes they are prosthetic devices. They can be artificial limbs or they can be orthotic devices such as leg braces or shoe inserts. So the durable medical equipment includes environmental devices as well as you know, in-home beds, person lifting, yeah, et cetera. Some recently some devices have been produced as consumer products that enable people to manage their own health care more independently and inexpensively, um, and especially during the pandemic. Uh, these things are now taking off, and I think we're all going to see a big change in the way healthcare is delivered, and a lot of it's going to be done through in-home medical devices, where in the past you would have had to go to a facility. There's blood and urine testing kits. Uh, there's monitors and meters. A lot of smart applications now are being fitted. You've got shirts you can wear that will help your vital signs. Uh, people taking medications can now do it at home. Uh, you, in addition to things like ventilators for uh, everything from premature infants to those who uh, require uh, uh, care that might have been a result of COVID. So uh, the respiratory equipment it also consists of you know, a pulse oximeter, some kind of supplementary oxygen devices, different things like that, and simply can't forget to mention in-home COVID tests. So what we're going to do right now is kind of... Uh, give you a, a tongue-in-cheek look at the history of quote-unquote medical devices, and it's just kind of a lighter uh, portion of our webinar because it's Friday afternoon and I don't want you to fall asleep or log off, so take a look at this for a couple of minutes. For thousands of years, tree panning, the drilling of holes in the head, was used to release evil spirits. And long before the current opioid epidemic, Opium, the highly addictive narcotic derived from the opium poppy plant, was a respectable go-to pain reliever. They used it for everything under the sun. So, you know, if you're having a bad day, you would take some opium. You're nervous, you take some opium. If you have some crying babies at home and you're a busy parent trying to go to the factory, you dose them up with some opium. Heroin, a derivative of opium, was once even sold over the counter by Bayer, for sore throats and respiratory ailments. At the opposite end of things, there were equally unscientific remedies. My gosh, they use so many different things in enemas. Pretty much anything in your kitchen cupboard could go into an enema, so things like milk and honey. Tell me about the tobacco enema. <laughs> You've probably heard of the term blowing smoke up someone's. Yes, that's where that expression comes from. In England, for a little while, they were actually used as a means of reviving drowning victims. And remember mummy eating? You're glad you don't. One of the weirdest things is that Egyptian mummies were taken from their tombs, stolen, and sold overseas because they were considered this fantastic remedy for everything. How could you be assured that you were eating a ground-up mummy and not just some random guy. That is true. And so people would sometimes take like dirt and soil and ashes and they'd be like, oh, this is bona fide real mummy. But a girl with any real spirit will throw herself wholeheartedly into the battle of the bulges. And for her, there are gymnasiums. Our gyms are different. If you don't mind a mauling, you don't have to work. The machines do everything. They beat you and knead you and pummel you and shake you. You just have to be able to take it. This is a shock machine from 1899. Believe it or not, in the early 1900s, it was widely believed that small doses of electricity could cure many ailments, from rheumatism to baldness. Shock machines, like this one, were often bought by ailing persons, so they could administer their own treatments without calling for the local doctor. The Sibley Voltamp shown here was patented in 1899 and underwent several iterations of battery improvement. To take the medicine, 
The wet sponge and metal probe were applied to the prescribed area. Then you shocked yourself after cranking the handle into feeling better. Here's a really cool antique coin operated shock machine. Back in the 1920s and 30s you'd find them in pharmacies. You could pay a penny and give yourself a pretty good jolt of electricity. They believed that was healthy for you and a lot of people used them back then. Today we call them quack medical devices. The way it works is you would insert your penny and you would turn this knob. As you can see on the indicator it continues to go up as I'm turning the knob clockwise. The electricity would continue to increase as I turn this knob and it would give me a pretty good jolt of electricity. Of course I'd have to be holding on to that, this knob with my left hand. But I'll show you the way it works. You put a penny in. Now if you listen, as I turn this knob you're going to hear it producing the electricity to give me the shock. Of course I'm not going to be holding on to that one because uh, I'm a little smarter than that. The electricity. And we've got some writing in there. This radiumizer, as now prepared, gives off approximately 30,000 Mach units of emanation per liter every 24 hours. And it says it's made by the Rocky Mountain Radium Products Company. And keep it in a cool place. This device is what was called an emanator. And at the uh, sort of the 1910s, 1920s, this was a very popular sort of quack medical device. The idea was it would put radon or emanation, as they call it back then, into drinking water. So the basic idea is you had a container of radium. That would be the one here on the left. You would blow air through it where it would pick up radon, which is the decayed daughter of, uh, of your uh, radium. And then you would blow that air into a, a, another container that had your drinking water in it. And then you would drink this to sort of uncertain health benefit. Um, in fact, we now know there is no health benefit to drinking or eating radioactive material. And in the uh, top of the box is some very detailed instructions on how to use this device. And it tells us how much radioactivity it supposedly has in it. It says that part one of the radiumizer, which is the cell that emits radium emanation, or as we know it now, radon, the radium element content of 120 micrograms and an equivalent or an equilibrium activity of 120 microcuries or 320,400 maca units. Okay. I'm Raymond Massey, and I have a special message for senior citizens. Today's doctors, drugs, and medical devices truly work medical miracles for young and old alike. But there are some as phony as a $3 bill. Like this Zeret applicator, for example, which has claimed to cure arthritis with Z-rays. There are no Z-rays. This fake device claimed to cure cancer with tape-recorded music. The practitioner who used it was as big a phony as his device. A doorbell doctor sold this food supplement to treat 42 diseases. It has nothing of value that's not contained in the food you buy at your supermarket. Investigate before you invest in health services or products. Help stamp out quackery. This has been a public service announcement from the Food and Drug Administration in cooperation with this station. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, those are some bizarre medical devices. There were, however, uh, in, during his story, history, there were some inventions that were good ideas and that continue to be used today. For example, catheters were used by ancient Syrians and they were made out of reeds. A form of a flexible catheter was invented by Benjamin Franklin for his brother who suffered from bladder stones. And the first pacemaker was invented as early as 1936 by Dr. Albert Hyman and was 10 inches long and weighed less than a pound. So I think most of us know what an FDA uh, classification of a home device is, but here it is for us to reference as we go forward. A device intended for use in the non-clinic environment, managed by a user. It's gotta have adequate labeling, of course, which we're gonna talk about. Might require some training by a healthcare professional, whether it's a hospital or a home healthcare provider. 
and it uh, obviously needs to be trained so it can be used safely and effectively. At this point, I'm going to hand it over to Nicole to talk about some considerations for the home devices. Thanks, Bill. So when making a device for in-home use as opposed to in some type of facility, uh, user issues need to be considered. As Bill mentioned, uh, individuals receiving care at home may have reduced physical strength or stamina, diminished visual or hearing abilities, impaired cognitive abilities, or some combination. A uh, couple examples of some use issues just for reference. The FDA database reported a dosing incident involving an individual who had been using an insulin pump for about four years. He had been using his previous pump for two years, but had purchased a new one three to four months before his incident. His cause of death was determined to be a severe hypoglycemic insulin reaction, and the report stated that he reported having difficulties with pump outputs despite no similar pump issues with the older style pump. It was concluded that usability problems with the new pump likely contributed to this person's death. Another example of home device user difficulty involved a home ventilator. A family member went into the patient's room one night and discovered that the patient had died and his ventilator was not functioning. The family member reported that no alarm had sounded and there was a problem with the ventilator's power cord. However, the police officer who arrived at the house manipulated the power cord to plug at the wall outlet and the ventilator powered up again. So it's crucial that regardless of a person's capabilities, the person should be able to use the device safely and effectively and without unintentionally making errors that could compromise the health of the person receiving the care. So in other words, it needs to be essentially foolproof to a certain degree. There should be very minimal requirements for calibration and maintenance. So another consideration is the environment of use. A home environment has a lot more uncontrolled variables than say a hospital. Uh, Bill mentioned a few of them earlier, but to go into a bit more detail, there's geographic location. Um, if you know you're out in the country in a setting where there's not a lot of nearby stores or something, you might not have ready access to any backup supplies or equipment if needed. Additionally, different parts of the country experience power outages more frequently, such as in Florida and Louisiana. There's uh, much more prone to hurricanes and flooding, so those homes will need to have backup plans and extra supplies. Also need to consider temperature extremes, that may negatively affect a device if you're in Alaska and you're dealing with extreme cold or you're in Florida dealing with humidity. Uh, age and structure of the home is another consideration. Older homes may not have appropriate uh, electrical outlets or they may have small doorways, hallways, or rooms that don't accommodate the equipment. Uh, In-home environmental hazards is probably the biggest uh, and that includes pets and children. Pets may chew through a cord, they might play with some accessory or part, unplugging it. Uh, their hair or fur may find their way into a device. Kids similarly may interfere with the device by messing with buttons, or they could even be injured themselves by playing with a device. Um, and finally, background noise. Uh, any loud noise in the home can interfere with the ability to hear whether a medical device is operating correctly or whether an alarm has sounded. You know, so you don't want to be vacuuming your home and you can't hear an alarm going off in the room down the hall. Uh, so those are just some considerations for home devices, and I will turn it back to Bill. Thank you, Nicole. So why have devices left the hospital? Uh, I think traditionally, and is continuing on to this day, is the climbing cost of health care and services in the hospital stays, as well as a shortage, especially now, of health care facilities and the nurse shortages um, have put pressure on the medical system to provide more care on an outpatient basis never as much as it's been in, since the pandemic when hospitals are increasingly needed for critical care as opposed to routine care that now is being shifted to the home. So the range and complexity of medical devices being used outside of hospitals uh, is, is increasing and it's increasing by a more diverse user population. Even complex devices such as ventilators, infusion pumps, and dialysis, dialysis machines can be used outside the hospital by the patients themselves, even though many of those devices were not originally designed for this type of use. And the, the last bullet there where it talks about non-clinical environments um, couldn't be more uh, important than it is today because, you know, you're going to be, people are going to be getting treatment from non-traditional locations, whether it's where they work, 
Uh, they may have to go to school and take a medical device with them, hotels, and obviously to get to a hotel, you may have traveled on a plane, train, or an automobile that would have had to house a medical device. Hotel stores, as, as you can see, the very, very different diverse requirements for at-home medical devices. So why is there a need for these? Uh, not only is the healthcare system extensive, expensive, but it is stressed. Uh, patients, especially now, are being released from hospitals and other health care facilities while they still need care. So as a result, both the uh, lay people and professional caregivers, they use a wide variety of techniques, some of them quite complex, uh, to manage health, assist others with health care, and receive assistance with health management. Uh, they provide support not only for related or care related to acute and chronic medical conditions, but also for disease prevention and lifestyle choices. One of the biggest issues is the final bullet on the slide is the human factors that have to be taken into consideration when you're designing uh, an, a medical device which is to be used at home. That you have to, what are the people's ability to operate that medical butt device gonna be? And it varies very widely. If you can think about the different types of care that can be provided. You have to look at the physical size, strength, and stamina of a user, their physical dexterity, flexibility, and coordination, you know, how, how much can they actually even manipulate the device, um, the extent of sensory capabilities, you know, can they hear, can they see, cognitive abilities, uh, do they have any type of memory impairment that would allow them or prohibit them from remembering or how to fully use the device, do they have comorbidities, uh, any language barriers, their general state of health, and their mo mental and emotional state of health. So clearly the benefits are uh, speak for themselves. We talked about the decreases in hospital time. Uh, they lower the cost of care, which is uh, a huge issue nowadays with managed care and the cost to our employers and those who self-insure. Uh, encourages patients to lead a healthier lifestyle by getting them out of the hospital bed, getting them into their homes where they can even get outside of their home onto a porch if it's in a wheelchair and get some fresh air and maybe spend some time with their family. It'll just help their overall well-being. Monitoring chronic diseases is going to be big from now on. Uh, people don't want to go back to the doctor's office. I, I, I'm, I'm probably getting ready to change my primary provider because during the pandemic, I had to go get a routine a prescription fulfilled and they told me I had to come in and if I wanted to do it on the phone I had to pay cash so there that's behind the times as far as I'm concerned um, anyway they can also obviously help save a life in a medical emergency and patient safety is going to be enhanced by uh, enabling for you to monitor yourself at home rather than just having to go into the hospital the problems associated with medical devices is that they're often not the same models as the ones used in the formal healthcare settings. Uh, ventilators, for example, the ones in hospitals are, are much larger and robust than the ones that are able to be taken home, that are portable, battery operated or battery backed up, uh, able to be driven to from appointments. Also, these devices uh, that formerly were in hospitals may be uh, older or lower quality and the professionals encountering these devices at home uh, may not be familiar with them. One of the biggest uh, concerns is that products that were used in an institution that may have been replaced by newer versions, they're now showing up on the uh, third party market because they're available. Um, they weren't designed to originally be used at homes, but people now may say, let me you know, go ahead and buy this and, and do this myself because I don't wanna go to the hospital. Healthcare professionals sometimes send people home with medical devices, as you know, TENS units, et cetera. Uh, consumers give the devices away or they sell them on eBay or Craigslist or, or, or the internet. And then the devices acquired are often not gonna be appropriate. Um, they're not gonna be properly trained and probably not gonna have complete IFUs, instructions for use. Mm -hmm. So uh, at this point, we're gonna shift gears a little bit and we're gonna hand it back to Nicole. She's gonna talk to you about some uh, legal uh, aspects of IFUs and some case law. Thanks, Bill. So the US FDA regulates all medical devices marketed in the US and they're grouped into three broad classes, uh, classified as either class one, two, or three, depending on the device's risk, invasiveness, and impact on the patient's overall health. 
So class one medical devices are exempt from pre-market notification processes. Specific class two devices are also exempt from pre-market approval. However, all devices are subject to the FDA's good manufacturing practice requirements for registration, labeling, and quality. To go into a bit uh, specifics for each class, class one devices are defined as devices which are not intended to use in supporting or sustaining life or of substantial importance in preventing impairment to human health, and they may not present a potential unreasonable risk of illness or injury. Uh, these devices are the most common. They make up 47% of approved devices on the market. Examples uh, include electric toothbrush, tongue depressor, oxygen mask, reusable surgical scalpel, bandages, and hospital beds. As noted, the majority of class one devices are exempt from FDA requirements for pre-market notification and pre-market approval, so they can be brought to the market fairly fast and easy. Class two devices are defined as devices for which general controls are insufficient to provide reasonable assurance of the safety and effectiveness of the device. Uh, they make up about 43% of the devices on the market. They include catheters, blood pressure cuffs, pregnancy test kits, syringes, blood transfusion kits, contact lenses, surgical gloves, and absorbable sutures. So the notable difference here is that class two devices often come into contact with the patient's cardiovascular system or internal organs or their diagnostic tools. So class two devices are subject to special controls, which include special labeling requirements, patient registries, and performance standards. The majority of class two devices come to the market using the pre-market notification uh, 510K process. It's a complex application and it's intended to demonstrate that a device is safe and effective by demonstrating that the device is equivalent to another device that is already on the market. So it doesn't need to be identical, but it must have significant similarities. Class three devices are those that usually sustain or support life or are implanted or present a potential unreasonable risk of illness or injury. Only 10% of devices fall into this class. Examples include breast implants, pacemakers, defibrillators, high frequency ventilators, cochlear implants, fetal blood sampling monitor, and implanted prosthetics. Uh, class three devices are subject to the pre-market approval process. This process requires a rigorous study of a medical device to prove safety and effectiveness through the development of a data-driven risk-benefit profile. Uh, there are usually clinical trials and significant data collection involved, and there also is an exemption for class three devices for a substantial equivalent as well. So turning to instructions for use, uh, medical devices all come with a user instruction manual, commonly called IFUs. They typically include basic operational information as well as warnings, cautions, troubleshooting, and maintenance instructions. Uh, so many IFUs, particularly for older devices, as Bill mentioned, they're tailored towards the professional use. They assume that someone in a hospital or similar setting will be using these devices, that that person likely has some type of prior training, or they're at least more familiar with certain terminology that is being used. Uh, now that certain devices are being transitioned to the home setting, however, the instructions need to account for the fact that a layperson will be reading and using the instructions. Um, again, as Bill mentioned, with older devices that are kind of coming on the third party market, Oftentimes, people get a medical device and the IFUs are outdated, or the device may not come with any instructions at all. Uh, in the case of rental equipment, the rental company may retain the instructions and the end user doesn't even end up receiving them. Um, then there's also the concern as to whether the home user is even going to read the instructions. Uh, many people, they buy an automobile or they buy a power tool every single day that, you know, these are devices that they know can cause them injury, yet they just take it out of the box, they start using it, they drive it off the lot, and they never read the instructions or warnings. So for litigation purposes, the defense that the person did not read the instructions is always helpful. However, the end user could potentially argue that the instructions were too cumbersome, too difficult to read, they were just too complex. Um, so that's a potential, you know, kind of rebuttal for that defense. Now, notably, the FDA does specifically review and approve the IFUs for class three devices. 
It reviews class two IFUs, but does not approve them. And class one IFUs are not reviewed at all. They really leave that up to the manufacturer. So turning now to uh, some more legal updates. Uh, you may or may not know that for product design defect cases, courts commonly use at least one of three tests to determine whether a product is defectively designed. That's the consumer expectations test, risk utility test, and reasonable alternative design test. So under the consumer expectations theory, a product is defectively designed if the plaintiff is able to demonstrate that the product did not perform as safely as an ordinary consumer would expect when used in the intended or reasonably foreseeable manner. The risk utility test, a product is considered unreasonably dangerous if the risk of danger in the design outweighs the benefits. Under the reasonable alternative design test, a product is defectively designed if the foreseeable risk of harm posed by the product could have been reduced or avoided by the adoption of a reasonable alternative design and the omission of the reasonable alternative design renders the product not reasonably safe. So notably, the uh, reasonable alternative design test is often subsumed into the risk utility test. So most courts only kind of refer to the consumer expectations test and risk utility test. Now, many states have adopted the second restatement of torts, which provides that the consumer expectations test and risk utility test are independent basis for finding a design defect. So you can use one or the other. Um, you can submit both theories to the jury. You can just submit one. That's kind of the um, governing rule. But several years ago, uh, the third restatement of torts was published, which took a different take. Uh, that provided that the consumer expectations test is not an independent basis for finding a design defect and that the risk utility test should be the exclusive test used. Uh, notably, that test under the third restatement required the plaintiff to prove a reasonable alternative design. Now, clearly, this places a much higher burden on a plaintiff to um, prove a defect in a product. Uh, so in Florida, at least the uh, Florida Supreme Court rejected the third restatement of torts. So Florida based its decision in part on several other state Supreme Courts that also rejected the third statement, and those states include Connecticut, Kansas, Missouri, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. So Florida kept the notion that the consumer expectations test and the risk utility test are independent basis for determining design defect. You don't have to rely solely on risk utility, and you certainly don't, the plaintiff does not have to prove a reasonable alternative design in order to prevail. Uh, the main policy behind this was that the courts in several states felt the burden of compensating victims of unreasonably dangerous products should be placed on the manufacturers who are most able to protect against the harm and not on the consumer injured by the product. So interestingly, in Florida at least, um, even though the Florida Supreme Court said that the two tests should be retained as independent basis, all of the court decisions after that have pretty much unanimously held that the jury has to consider the consumer expectations test. They cannot just consider risk utility by itself. And this is kind of interesting because there is a line of case law previously that held the consumer expectations test jury instruction is not required in all product liability cases. Rather, it's only proper when the product in question is one about which the ordinary consumer could form expectations. So a, the basis for this is that some products may be too complex for the ordinary consumer to have any expectations about its proper operation. Those cases often involve a medical device accessible to the consumer only through a physician. As you know, medical device manufacturers, they generally do not market their products to ordinary consumers, but rather promote and advertise their products to intermediaries such as hospitals, physicians, and other trained medical professionals. Now, in October of 2020, in Florida at least, uh, there was finally a more recent case that ruled that the consumer expectations test does not need to be applied in a complex medical device accessible to the consumer only through a medical professional. Uh, the court did note that the complexity of the product does not necessarily depend on its technology or use, but rather depends on whether prolonged use, knowledge, or familiarity of the product's performance by consumers is sufficient to allow consumers to form reasonable expectations of the product's safety. Um, so this is important because, you know, even if the product is not necessarily that complex, 
in technology or difficult to use, if the product has not been on the market long, if it has not been used by the consumer long, then the consumer may not have reasonably uh, formed any expectations as to its use. Additionally, the court noted that if the test was to be used, it should be based on the reasonable ex expectations of the intermediary, such as the physician that recommended the product rather than the actual consumer. So this kind of line of cases is certainly helpful um, for the medical device product liability cases because it definitely uh, puts a higher burden on the plaintiff to try to prove a defect. So turning briefly kind of back to the classes, uh, there is an important kind of line of cases out there on preemption. Prior to the enactment of the 1976 medical device amendments, the regulation of medical devices in the U.S. largely fell under state control. So the federal government did not require medical devices to undergo safety or effectiveness review prior to entering the stream of commerce and did not authorize any control over the introduction of new medical devices. Uh, so that video we showed at the end, there was that FDA, uh, you know, kind of news feed warning you about quack medicine that clearly came out about the time the federal government decided to step in and put a stop to all of these um, kind of silly state uh, allowed medical devices. So. Class three devices, as we went over, are subject to the most rigorous level of FDA scrutiny. And so under the supremacy clause of the U.S. Constitution, the federal laws are the supreme laws of the land, and therefore they preempt state law. So any claim that imposes a state law requirement with respect to medical devices that is different from or in addition to any federal requirement imposed by the FDA is preempted. Um, so it's a pretty narrow gap for preemption. Um, you can be expressly preempted. You can be impliedly preempted. Um, and some, you know, to not go through a bunch of legalese, uh, the law creates a narrow gap through which a plaintiff's state law claim must fit if it's to escape express or implied preemption. So the plaintiff must be suing for conduct that violates the FDA or else their claim is expressly preempted but the plaintiff must not be suing because the conduct violates the FDA or then it's impliedly preempted. So this is a very high burden to meet. Um, essentially, this permits uh, many lawsuits relating to class three medical devices to be thrown out at the beginning of the lawsuit um, and essentially just be dismissed. So very briefly, kind of some recent stuff in the news. Uh, December 2020, Apria Healthcare Group agreed to pay $40.5 million to settle a lawsuit claiming that they were submitting false claims to federal health companies, or excuse me, programs. So essentially what they were doing was they're renting these non-invasive ventilators, and first of all, they were not even checking whether the patient could actually pay for them. Rather, they were just sending out these payment waivers so that they could submit the claims directly to Medicare and Medicaid. But more importantly, they were not complying with the requirement to ensure that the ventilators were a basic medical requirement of the patient's treatment. So they might not have even been medically necessary, and yet they were renting out this equipment. Um, so this is certainly a consideration. Uh, if you know this ever comes up in a lawsuit, if a person's allegedly injured at home by a medical device, you know, and they didn't even need the device, then, you know, how does that affect liability? You could certainly bring in third parties, you could bring in the rental company, maybe the doctor who recommended, recommended it and things of that nature. Uh, finally, in early 2020, California enacted a connected devices security law, which required manufacturers to equip connected devices with, quote, reasonable security that protects consumers from hackers. So Bill is going to go over this in a bit more detail in a few, but essentially, you know, all these kind of medical devices are connected to the internet, and so they can be hacked. And the FDA has been toying with how to further develop, you know, a recommendation for medical device cybersecurity. And California has kind of taken the lead on enacting this law. And so they'll be certainly monitored to see how it plays out. But the biggest question is, you know, what is a reasonable security feature um, that can include password requirements, dual authentication, you know, dual authentication being that kind of annoying process where you put in your correct password and then uh, they send you a text and they need you to enter the code. 
inevitably with me, I'm trying to sign on to Amazon and the code's being texted to my husband, who of course isn't responding, and then I'm locked out. Um, so it can certainly be frustrating, but obviously it's an important uh, security feature, especially for a medical device that could mean the difference between life or death. So with that, I am gonna turn it back over to Bill. Thank you, Nicole. And at this point, we'll start wrapping up. It is 2.45, almost 2.45 on a Friday afternoon. And thank you again for being in there with us. Um, the future of medical devices is um, a lot more than it was a year ago, clearly. And uh, it's just now probably touching the bounds of your imagination and then some. Obviously, the hospitals and the physicians can monitor people at home. They're doing so much more now than ever before. Um, they can monitor vitals, they can assess treatment when administering medications that normally would have been done uh, on an inpatient basis. Telehealth is huge. Um, I'll go into that a little bit more, but that's, that's where everything obviously is headed. Improved devices are things like smart bandages, uh, smart shirts. Um, obviously, Apple has the watches and the Fitbits and things like that. And then you're going to be able to have hands-free control of devices through applications. I don't even turn on the light in my office anymore. Uh, Alexa does it for me. So imagine what she can do with home health devices. And then miniaturization and mobility. But going back to telehealth, this is really um, is going to be affected by COVID-19. Um, you know, there, there were some studies done that um, during the pandemic, um, there was twice the number of heart attacks uh, as before the pandemic because people just did not go to the hospital when they felt sick. Uh, when I say twice the amount of heart attacks, I mean twice the amount of deaths from heart attacks. So you've got fewer patients who are willing to go get treatment. Um, me specifically, I don't want to go to the doctor unless I have to, and certainly if I can do it over the phone, and if I can do it for a sick child, even better. The big issues with the telehealth um, are the HIPAA, control, HIPAA um, compliance. So you've got now everybody from uh, Amazon to Zoom to um, Verizon are coming out with their all new uh, HIPAA compliant private devices. Obviously, we've all heard about Zoom bombings over the last year, and that's not going to work in telehealth. So these new um, applications are coming in that will allow compliance and data security. They will allow the consumers to monitor their own bodies at home. So you've got a lot more people who are going to wake up in the morning and, and either just hook up to a device, or I, I think Apple's even coming out with the devices now that are going to monitor even more vitals uh, on your wrist than before. Uh, we talked a little bit about the, the telehealth, uh, the smartphones, et cetera, that are here, but that is definitely the, the biggest um, emergence coming from COVID. What are some dangers of connectivity? Um, we all know about Wi-Fi. Uh, we know it's connected in the home. The Internet of Things is what's talked about. I can tell you uh, I was pretty surprised over the last few months when I started getting emails from my washer and dryer and my um, thermostat telling me how they did the last month. Clearly, when you get a new device and you hook it up, if you want Amazon to Alexa to change the temperature, you're going to have to hook it up to the Internet. So you're going to be hooking home health devices up here. Um, are they the weakest, weakest link into your home? Or can someone get into your home through your washer and dryer and then get to your medical device? These are issues which are just now coming to the forefront, which are greater minds than mine will certainly have to come up with solutions for. But you've got, like I said, electronic medical devices, computers will be controlling them, smartphones. I mean, everything's going to have an app. Things we haven't even developed are going to have an app. Um, nanoparticles are, are a whole different webinar, but you know those are obviously the tiniest particle that is a, a computer component. And if you can hack that, imagine what you can do. And I don't even want to imagine what ransomware could do if someone could get into your home's uh, network and hold you ransom with regards to a medical device. So we're going to just end with a, a little clip here before we go into Q&A. It talks a little bit about the hacking and what's happening at the government level. The U.S. government is taking a closer look at how to stop hackers from taking control of medical devices like pacemakers. An inspector general's report last month found the Food and Drug Administration's plans and processes were deficient for addressing medical device cybersecurity compromises. 
The FDA disputes that and says it has worked proactively on the issue. Anna Warner shows us how the agency is now coordinating with hackers to detect potential problems. That's an interesting tactic. Anna, good morning. Yeah, good morning. Well, many people may not realize that medical devices, some of them run on computers, and like computers, they can be hacked. Now, so far, neither government officials nor security experts have identified any incidents in which a computer hacker has harmed a patient through a medical device. But these cybersecurity researchers say those devices have massive vulnerabilities that make it easy for hackers to break in. There's nothing stopping us from in a garage taking them apart and hacking them, nothing. Talk to Billy Rios and Jonathan Butts about the security of medical devices and... We've yet to find a device that we've looked at that we haven't been able to hack. Wait, you're yet to find a medical device that you cannot hack? That is correct. The two security researchers have examined critical machines like pacemakers, drug infusion pumps, and insulin pumps, devices that help keep people alive, and found all have vulnerabilities that would allow someone else to take control of the machines. The reason? All of those devices are run by computers, and computers can be hacked. This is all kind of yeah, chilling. I mean, that's why we do this. FDA is now working with these two researchers and others to try to catch these things Mm -hmm. before anybody can do anything with them to hurt somebody. Is there any sign that other people are doing this, that are hacking them in in order to harm people? Well, that's the thing, is they're trying to get out ahead of it. They don't have any ca specific cases that they know about right now, but they don't want to wait until it happens in Yeah, somebody. thank you, Mr. Rios and Mr. Butts. I saw it on a TV show and thought, that's a TV show. Now we on know Homeland. it ain't a TV yeah. show. Mm -hmm. On Homeland is right. Thank you, Anna. And that concludes our presentation. So at this point, um, we'll open it up to some, some Q&A if there's anybody left out there that has uh, headed to happy hour yet. Thanks very much, Phil and Nicole. That was a chilling clip to end on and certainly something that we'll need to revisit in the future. Um, we did receive a few questions for you from our listeners. First, can you comment on any differences in product liability risk for a device manufacturer uh, between home use and uh, hospital use or clinician use devices? Yeah, so that's just going to turn a bit, you know, going to be a lot of factors at play there. So kind of like what we talked about before with that consumer expectations test that a lot of courts uh, throughout the country use. You know, what is the, who is the consumer for this device? You know, is it someone, is it a physician that while maybe the product wasn't made for the hospital and it was made for in-home use, the physician is the one who is purchasing it from the supplier or the manufacturer and recommending it? You know, what kind of expectations has this person formed about it? And, you know, if you can't use the consumer expectations test, the risk utility design test is a lot harder for uh, consumers to kind of meet their burden of proof because they have to show that the risk of the product outweighed the benefits. And depending on the product, I'm sure the benefits are pretty high, uh, you know, comparatively. So that's a consideration that the instructions for use is certainly a big consideration. You know, were these instructions tailored towards the at-home user or were they still worded in a way that's kind of tailored more towards a hospital setting and things of that nature. Um, so there's definitely a lot of variables at play. You know, a typical lawyer answer, it all depends. Um, but those are just some uh, considerations to keep in mind. Thank you. Um, you know, knowing that, do you have any best practices that you would recommend for instructions for use um, for home use devices versus quick reference guides? I, I think that, you know, it's similar to what you see with most new types of devices. If you buy an iPad, you don't get an instruction manual. You get a quick reference guide, and then they tell you to go on the web. That's certainly not going to fly with medical devices. I think that you're going to have to follow the regulations concerning the IFUs, while at the same time being cognizant of the fact that a consumer is probably not going to read them to the extent or understand them to the extent that a clinician might. So you probably want to have some type of um, cheat sheet, if you will. But I can tell you from a legal perspective, um, that would really concern me a little bit unless it had a lot of disclaimers on it because you're going to get people who are going to come in and say, I, I didn't read the instructions, but I read the cheat sheet, but it didn't tell me I wasn't supposed to 
unplug the backup battery or I had to charge the backup battery, et cetera. So it's, 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 it's going to determine over time. But it, from a legal perspective, the cheat sheets, so to speak, are a little worrisome. But they're going to be helpful. Uh, with regard to regulations, can you comment on any differences uh, in the regulatory obligations for devices when they're intended for home use rather than in a clinical setting? I think that the, the answer to that is going to be, uh, you know, with clinical versus the home, the, the products are going to be regulated based upon the indications, you know, how they're going to be used. A ventilator is a ventilator is a ventilator, whether it's going to be used in a hospital or it's going to be at home to some extent. Um, you know, for prescription products that are only sold to medical providers, you don't have to worry about that because those are, you know, there's the learned intermediary doctrine in a lot of places that protects manufacturers from consumer claims for things that were sold or intended to be sold to doctors. That being said, um, you're going to have to be devising things, assuming that they are going to have to be understood by people at home as well. You know, for example, a ventilator, you've got a case where, you know, a, a baby's born prematurely and spends 18 months in hospitals until it can leave. It's been on hospital ventilators, but it's got to go home with an at-home ventilator. So during the stay in the hospital, the parents are trained on this new ventilator, which then they take home. So do they take home the IFUs? Um, do they take home the knowledge? Do they, and what, what are they really going to get at home? And who was this ventilator intended for? Because it certainly wasn't sold to the parents. It was sold to a DME provider. Thank you. Um, and I think we have just one last question. Um, we're going to ask you to look into the future a little bit. Uh, could you discuss any impact you think the COVID-19 pandemic may have on the use or particularly the adaptation of the sophisticated medical devices for home use and what this might mean for products liability risk? Sure. Um, I, and I, I talked a little bit about it. I think telehealth is going to be huge and not just the telehealth that we're used to when um, your, your child or you're sick and you call into teledoc and then they get your information and then you get a, a FaceTime back from doctor. There's going to be a lot more to it. There's going to be people on medical devices that are now going to be, you know, plugging these into their computer, hooking them up to their internet. And the person who is viewing them or talking to them over their device or their TV screen is going to be at the same time monitoring their vital signs, monitoring different things. So I think we're going to see a, a, a radical shift from patient care being provided at facilities, doctor's offices, hospitals, to home. And I think that's going to be out of necessity um, for the ability to provide it at the hospital, but it's also going to be a desire because how many of us really want to go back to the doctor or the hospital as much as we used to in the past when simply we don't have to. It's, it's like Zoom, you know, you, you do, are we all going to be taking as many trips as we used to for meetings or are we going to be doing a lot more over the uh, internet? So I think we're going to have the exact same effect on healthcare in the future, a lot more virtual, a lot more convenient from a liability perspective. Again, where, where was that device? You know, it, is Apple selling medical devices that they got to be very concerned about that? Or are you selling a medical device to which you reasonably should expect to wind up in a consumer's hands, but your IFU is geared towards a clinician? So it's, it's, you got to look into a crystal ball a little bit. Bill and Nicole, thank you very much for your time today. This is a critical topic at the moment, and I know your presentation will be valuable to our audience. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, Heather, and, and thank you, Katie, and, and thank you, Medmark. We, we appreciate you giving us the opportunity. And if anybody needs any additional advice, feel free to reach out to Nicole and I at the information on the screen or our website. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.